Okay, mating up um, pieces on shafts. We can have a keyway. We could also, instead of a keyway, we could have our shaft and we could have splines. If we have splines out here, one of the big advantages to that is that we have lots of area that grabs. And I guess I should have brought out, but people have seen keys anyway. So we're going, going on to a hub. We have lots of area that grabs. It also, with splines, it centers itself a little bit. It might be loose in here. Generally, they are. But it will center itself when it's torquing, even if these are just angles and not involutes that they talk about. And we should talk a little bit more specifically on splines at a different time. And that might even be today. <laughs> so, but the splines will self-center themselves a little bit. <coughs> Shafts, a straight shaft doesn't do that. If we have a straight shaft, we have, have a hub out here again, and we have a shaft, and there's this area in between them, and we'll magnify that area, and we'll make it loose. So this is in the case of not a... Uh, interference fit. These aren't heat shrunk, they aren't pressed on, there's just a space in between the two. So what you do in this case is you put normally a set screw in here and normally a set screw at 90 degrees and that pushes it so that it's tight over against one side and that tightness on the one side gives it good support because it's setting in the hub against a lengthwise surface. It's solid there. And the set screws push it so it's solid. Now, when I first started out, I had seen the two like that, and somebody had one over here. And I thought, oh, that's good. More set screws. So I talked to one of my mentors, and I said, well, why don't we just do this and put a fourth one out here? And he said, well, that looks good at first, but it's really stupid. And he was right, because you're just setting on the four points of the set screw only, and you are holding the shaft through the threads of the set screws. If you, get them, if you don't have them adjusted right, the one that's not pushing is doing nothing. It had no function. It's just there to look pretty if it's loose. But if they're all tight, so that you keep this space in between, then you're setting just on the set screws. You're not setting in the hub at all. So you're really better off with just two. Now, the two could be at 90 degrees, could be at 60 degrees, um, could be at 120 degrees. The angle is not real important, but they can't be at 180. Because at 180, they're just fighting each other. You want to push towards solid material. 90 degrees is normally used not because it's magic but because it's easy. 90 is easy to do. Look at it, not critical, eyeball it. You're looking at this one, you drill one on the other side. It's just a matter of ease. Some engineers like 60 degrees, some like 120, but 90 is the most common. Normally, when you have one like this, you have a keyway. And your keyway, regardless of what type of keyway it is, your keyway will be over a set screw generally. They do that because when you have a non-captured keyway like this one here, that helps to keep the key itself from coming out. The key would be setting in here, so you'd have a piece of square key stock. We won't bother writing the ends. And then over the top of it would be a set screw, which would push down, bite into that piece of key stock, and help it from falling out the end. It won't guarantee that it doesn't fall out the end, but it will help it. There's always going to be a little bit of play in this key. So it's not good for a high horsepower application. Uh, you can make it okay for a higher horsepower application by using a longer piece of shaft. If we have a long section that our hub fits on and a long key, now that key can do more. So, but on a normal short one, 
<clears throat> you've got to limit your horsepower quite a bit because the key is going to move. Now, another thing that's done with these, um, instead of going to splines, and it's normally done as an update, is you'll see somebody add a second keyway. So they'll add a second keyway and a second key in here. And the problem with that is <coughs> getting those two exactly the same, both in the hub and in the key. And I've done some of them where I've had to put four of them in there for people. Um, if you give me both pieces, we'll probably get it all to match. I don't know if the last guy cut it exactly the same squaring as what I've got. All we can do is make our part as accurate as possible. Um, if we're really going down to redesign that, let's try and use splines if we can. Now, to take care of the problem of if we don't have a set screw over this for keeping the key from falling out, we can take care of that by doing one of the captured methods, which here would be just the fact we in milled a pocket in here that is captured. Or we can use a Woodruff key, half moon key. Um, <clears throat> and these are sized by a number. This one here is a 1010. So that will be 5 sixteenths of an inch wide, or 10 30 seconds. And the 10, I believe, is 10 eighths. So it will be an inch and a quarter for the diameter of what this was. And then there's a set, uh, I'd have to look up for what the height that it, where it's cut off. Um, but those are standard units. Then there's metric ones which are made on a different proportions. Um, and I just started stocking metric Woodruff keys because I've run into some metric stuff where I needed those. Some metric stuff will have inch Woodruff, it'll be mixed up all over the world both ways on that. Uh, big thing I don't have yet are the metric cutters. Now, you can generally use an inch cutter. Um, you could cheat it and grind down the diameter a little bit if you needed, or some of them are close enough for diameter, but you'd use a smaller one and cut in and then go down a little further. Do it in two steps to get the width you need for the metric. So. You can, you can get by for most of the emergency work that you would be doing. But I'm trying to find a good set of uh, metric Woodruff key cutters to put in my collection of new toys. Splines. <clears throat> splines are, we're using splines. Splines will let us have, oh, we got another thing too, which we might as well. On our, on our, before we get to splines, on our shaft yet, yeah, we've got our shaft, and we've got our hub, and out here we have our shaft, and we have our hub, and we are, I'm going to draw, that's actually the hub in there, I drew it smaller than the shaft, so we're doing a heat shrink on this one. <laughs> They're going to be touching each other, but um, you heat it up, put it on, it shrinks on. Same thing with a press fit, except on a press fit, you press it on, and uh, sometimes there's scoring with that. I'm, I'm, I really like heat shrink, but on really small sizes, heat shrink doesn't work as well, because you just, you have to get it way too hot to get enough to give you the certain amount of clearance you want to be able to get it on. That's hard to get with a quarter inch shaft. So you end up on a quarter inch shaft if you're doing something like that more likely to have just a straight press fit. Now, another thing that we will do here, uh, this one I like real well for standard couplings. We will make that a taper and we will have a secondary piece. It'll have a bit of a flat there. We'll have a secondary piece that fits in here and is tapered. Now, somehow there will be bolts to draw these together. There's quite a few different varieties. The original one for the U.S. market was the taper lock fittings. And then there's the QD taper locks. There's the browning. <coughs> there's some various metric ones. <clears throat> and uh, that allows you to suck down to a shaft without having to have a exact size that matches between the two, the taper. That's, that's really handy for medium size, quick fit stuff. 
You can buy a piece of shaft that already exists. You can buy this hub assembly with a sprocket on it or uh, weld on to a piece of plate or whatever you want. Um, fairly easy. They have bolts that draw the taper in and bolts that push the taper back out to remove it. So, <clears throat> and I actually think we did one on some QDs way back, mentioning some QD couplers. I'm pretty sure we did back when you first started here. Just real quickly running through some of them. Um, anyway, we'll go to splines. And I'm just not even, I'm going to start over on that. We'll get a, get a new board. <clears throat> splines. So, we got a shaft and we're going to want to make splines on it. We got lots of ways we can do it. We could make some straight cut-ins just straight sided cut-ins and if we do that it's essentially <clears throat> a bunch of keyways going around the outside we could also do these with an angle on them we could do them to where we come down to a V in the middle usually a little bit of a radius we can also do one which is called a, uh, the hub is going to meet the same way. They have one that, that, that is basically a gear tooth. <clears throat> and now the uh, square sided one, it doesn't do a lot as far as making a nice uh, application of power and centering it's either going to be correct because the square sides all line up correct or more likely it's a little loose and within those it can move and when the torque applies it will stay tight in the driving but it won't push it to the middle when you have the angles it will push it to the middle because you have <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know how I'm drawing this. Anyway, your hub is going to come in here, and the angles people are going to get mad at me for not making perfect drawings or bringing out actual pieces to look at, but it's what we have. So this will center a little bit as those angles because of the angles between the two. What they did and has become really popular on a lot of newer designs and it has a lot of value in jet engines, turbine engines, stuff like that, is they come in here and instead of having these tapered surfaces, they make them gear teeth essentially. This one here is a tooth, this one's a tooth, uh, and this one here is a bit of a tooth. Fact is, a top will even look like a gear tooth. So you essentially have a gear inside of a gear, and they call those involute splines. <clears throat> well, this is beautiful for high speed and for centering, and even if it's off center, because they're gear teeth, they will still run even if they're slightly off center. If the bearings are off center, they will still run smooth. On the other side of that, you have a small area of contact. So where these were used, um, they're great for high speed, for needing accuracy. A lot of people in high torque applications that didn't really need the speed, anti-vibration or any of that, went to using these involutes. And when you look at them in real life, what you will see taking the stuff apart is you will see a smashed in area here from this one or you will see two smashed off areas and basically you will have sort of angled spline teeth that are all beat up in a relatively short time because it doesn't have enough area 
with this involute contacting. Now, <clears throat> in the hot rod community, like on the uh, nine inch Ford rear ends that I've dealt with a little bit, a lot of the splines that are made to go in there, the original one was an involute spline, and they'll cut them with just a straight 60 degree, which is the pressure angle of the gears, the gear teeth that they were cutting in here was 60 degrees. So they'll just cut them with a 60 degree angle, and they, they work fine. They work fine. There's a lot of stuff where the involute improvement is not really an improvement, and people have gone back, and part of where I'm saying that is they've gone back for actual applications and replaced them with straight-sided splines in place of an involute. At the same time, in the one-off shop, cutting stuff on my slaughter, I'm not going to bother trying to cut an involute shape to mate nicely and wear nice with this. I am going to come in here, and this is usually um, usually one piece. The shaft is already worn some. I will cut what's close to this, use the shaft to fit it, and I will cut generally with, unless it's, it's some reason why I really, really it's an off shape. I will try and cut a straight sided that fits and works. And it, it gets you going. You're not, you're not what it was supposed to be originally new, but it works, it works good. You don't need to match that involute spline. Most of the time for low speed, high torque applications, it was a mistake to begin with. But it sounds good because it helps more in the centering. When you help with the centering but decrease the load area so much though, um, if we need a gear inside of a gear, we now have two wearing components. The spline in a low speed, high torque application is not really wearing. It pushes to one side and it stays there as this rotates around for years. Um, there's no reason to really have that small contact area. That's my take on it. I'm sure there's some engineer that will tell me that in-loop splines are wonderful in all applications, just like other things. That there's always should be done a certain way because it's always the best way. Um, they're neat. They fit good. If I was building a jet engine, a uh, jet turbine, yeah. Yeah, we're going to do some involute splines. We're going to minimize the, the problems in there from high speed. Uh, they use them some in automatic transmissions, and some of those gears turn pretty good speed in there um, as they're coming through the planetaries and might be, might be beneficial. In most of the medium size uh, 2 inch to 12 inch shafts that you deal with in the industries that I service, they are a waste and a detriment. So, little bits on splines and keys and yeah. Okay.